Hello and welcome to a summary of all you need to know about The Necklace, which is a short story by Guy de Montpassant. Now, I will explain the meaning related to this text as it appears in the Pearson International GCSE Edexcel Anthology, and I'll highlight literary and language devices as well as contextual factors that you should be aware of when studying this text. So let's get started. Now, before I go into detail when reading the text and then highlighting and pointing out the literary techniques that Maupassant uses, I'm going to go into a little bit of context. Now, do bear in mind that Guy de Maupassant lived in a time when women had very few rights, including the right to vote. So the role of women was to be subservient to men and to obey them. So, of course, when we're thinking about the main character in this story, Mathilde, who's really focused on social status and what her husband was making, but also marrying rich men, this, of course, was tied to the contextual reality that actually she had very few other options other than marrying better in order to improve her social standing. Also, bear in mind that many women during this time were really unable to have independence and they were expected to marry and simply produce children as part of their purpose as wives. Many women did feel trapped at this time and they weren't really free to have career paths. Indeed, they really relied on their husbands and one thing too that makes it really interesting in terms of this context is that women did control the social status of their family, which was as important a role as the men earning the money. So when we think about the character Mathilde, she would have been trying to impress her friends with, for example, the expensive necklace. So now I'll begin by reading this first chunk of the passage. I'll then highlight important literary techniques that you need to be aware of, and I'll read through the rest of the passage, stopping every so often and highlighting important techniques. So let's begin. She was one of those pretty delightful girls who, apparently by some area of fate, get themselves born the daughters of very minor civil servants. She had no dowry, no expectations, no means of meeting some rich, important man who would understand love and marry her. So she went along with the proposal made by a junior clerk in the Ministry of Education. She dressed simply, being unable to afford anything better, but she was every whit as unhappy as any daughter of a good family who's come down in the world. Women have neither rank nor class, and their beauty, grace and charm do service for birthright and connections. Natural guile, instinctive elegance and adaptability are what determines their place in the hierarchy, and a girl of no birth to speak of may easily be the equal of any society lady. So now this is a really, really interesting opening and it creates a lot of mystery and intrigue about Mathilde. And of course, do you remember, if the author is using things like she rather than telling us her name directly, this is cataphoric reference. So therefore, Montpassant uses cataphora to reveal Mathilde's name later on in the passage. Now, firstly, let's look at the title itself. So do you remember that The Necklace was published in 1884? Of course, this is towards the end of the Victorian era. And of course, it was published in the French context, but of course, read widely and internationally. Now, Guy de Montpassant uses the third person pronoun and repeats this. And as I mentioned, this is a cataphoric reference. We later on learn that she's called Mathilde, but of course, it really centers the main focus of this story. Also, the pre-modifiers, pretty, delightful, show Mathilde's beauty. And the mention of fate, this abstract noun, shows that she just had a really bad fortune as a beautiful woman to not be born into a very wealthy family, but equally not to marry very highly. Also, there's this constant focus on social class, and this is going to be a recurring theme throughout this passage. And of course, this is already injected in the first line where there's the mention of very minor civil servants. Of course, we learn that Mathilde comes from a lower middle class social background. Also, the repetition of no, so no dowry, no expectations, no means of meeting some rich. Now, this repetition shows Mathilde's modest background, but equally the, the modest income of the men that she were eligible to marry her. Furthermore, the alliteration here, means of meeting, shows that her future and fortune and fate was really tied to who she married, because as I mentioned, contextually speaking, women at this time really had very few rights and really their role was mainly to be subservient to their husbands and really it was a draw of the luck whoever they married. And so, of course, if they married rich, they would be quite lucky because they would socially progress in that way. However, if they didn't marry rich, then they would be in some ways doomed to either a life of middle class misery or poverty. 
Now, there's a mention of understand, love and marry her. And the rule of three is used here by Maupassant. And it shows how women were totally and completely dependent on the men that they married. Furthermore, the adjective junior to describe the clerk, the job of her husband, really emphasizes his lower middle class social status. We can't quite call him working class because he is educated. However, he's definitely not wealthy. We also learn that Mathilde dressed simply and the sibilance is used here to really emphasize that. However, we learn that this made her deeply discontented. She really disliked the fact that she didn't socially advance through marriage. And of course, she also even never received dowry payment. Furthermore, there's this mention of her feeling like she's come down in the world. And this is somewhat ironic because she's actually preserved her social status. Her parents were lower middle class. And of course, she's married a lower middle class man. However, she feels really undeserving of this status. Also, the rule of three here again is used, beauty, grace and charm, and this shows the importance of women's appearance. This was really the only currency during this time, and they had to really use it in order to get an eligible bachelor to marry them. Furthermore, the mention of natural guile, instinctive elegance and adaptability, essentially these were the qualities women needed to have socially advanced chances and this was really important in terms of their advancements as both women but eventually as wives. Furthermore the mention of hierarchy this proper noun again reinforces the notion of social Victorian hierarchy which were very very rigid. Also the dysphemism that's used here and remember euphemism is a very polite way to refer to something that's maybe not very nice and dysphemism is the opposite. It's a fairly harsh way to refer to something so there's dysphemism that's being used here to describe Mathilde's lack of social pedigree so she is of no birth. Furthermore, the mention of her being easily the equal of any society lady, what this shows is that women could use superficial appearances such as their beauty to get ahead in the social hierarchy. This is what Mathilde really wanted, but she was ultimately unable to achieve this. So let's carry on. She was unhappy all the time, for she felt that she was intended for a life of refinement and luxury. She was made unhappy by the rundown apartment they'd lived in, the peeling walls, the battered chairs and the ugly curtains. Now all this, which any other woman of her station might never even have noticed, was torture to her and made her very angry. The spectacle of the young Breton peasant girl who did the household chores stirred sad regrets and impossible fancies. She dreamed of silent antechambers hung with oriental tapestries lit by tall bronze candelabras and of two tall footmen in liveried breeches asleep in the huge armchairs dozing in the heavy heat of a stove. She dreamed of great drawing rooms dressed with old silk, filled with fine furniture which showed off trinkets beyond price, and of pretty little parlours filled with perfumes and just made for intimate talk at five in the afternoon with one's closest friends, who would be the most famous and sought-after men of the day, whose attentions were much coveted and desired by all women. When she sat down to dinner at the round table spread with three-day-old cloth, facing a husband who always lifted the lid of the soup tureen and declared delightedly, Ah, stew, splendid! There's nothing I like better than a nice stew. She dreamed of elegant dinners, gleaming silverware and tapestries which peopled the walls with mythical characters and strange birds in enchanted forests. She dreamed of exquisite dishes served on fabulous china plates, of pretty compliments whispered into willing ears and received with sphinx-like smiles over the pink flesh of a trout or the wings of a hazel hen. Now, this part of the story shows just how detached from reality Mathilde is in terms of how she constantly retreats to this inner world that she really, really aspires to, this inner world of refinement, of opulence, and this inner world is a sharp contrast and there's a strong dissonance between her present reality, hence why she's so unhappy. She believes that she'd be quite wealthy, they should have a lot of money, she should be married to a man who is of more means, but she isn't. Now, in this part of the passage, again, the mention of unhappy is repeated again. And of course, this emphasizes Mathilde's obsession with her social status and her social standing. Also, the mention of a life of refinement and luxury. This shows Mathilde's social ambition to have married better. 
Furthermore, we learn that she's really unhappy because of the rundown apartment that they lived in, the peeling walls, the battered chairs, and the ascendanton hair essentially shows that she looks around and she is very, very ungrateful for what she has. She really, really hates everything that surrounds her because she really believes that she should be surrounded by a lot of opulence and luxury. Furthermore, the reference to her station, again, this is an allusion to her social pedigree, and of course it builds up on this idea that she's a woman of no birth. Also, there's the hyperbole used here, torture. Again, what Guy de Montpassant is trying to do, he's almost satirizing just how unhappy she is. And so he's using lots of hyperbole to show that a life which actually isn't that bad, she sees it as terrible because she doesn't have all the opulence she believes she deserves. Also, we learn that she is actually served and helped at home by a young Breton peasant girl and Breton is a part of France. So, of course, if you think about even the structure of the, of the French country and how historically Parisians were most affluent and people from outside of Paris were less affluent. What this promodifiers show is she's middle class but she really looks down on French people outside of Paris and so she's really disgusted that even if they do have a maid she's actually from Breton. So again this is actually quite ironic because it shows that actually in terms of her lifestyle she still lives a relatively decent life the fact that she has a maid even if she's perhaps a peasant actually that's much better than a lot of people during uh, this time in France also there's a mention of this all stirring sad regrets and impossible fancies and of course here there's the sibilance stirred sad and this shows Mathilde's illusions about an upper class lifestyle so she's really detached from her reality and she does a lot to really just retreat into her inner world this retreat into the inner world is further emphasized through the repetition of dreamed again she lives in this world of illusion of what she thinks she should live rather than actually being firmly rooted in the reality of what surrounds her also there's a lot of opulent language used by Guy de Montpassant, so uh, silent antechambers, oriental tapestries, bronze candelabras, and this refers to large palaces again this paints a picture of the lifestyle that Mathilde really aspires to Furthermore, the alliteration filled with fine furniture shows her retreat into her inner world of what she wants, these fanciful desires. Furthermore, the diminutive adjective, pretty little parlours, again, shows just how somewhat vapid she is. She's really upset because she doesn't have these things that actually are not that important. They show, of course, luxury and opulence, but actually they're not that important. But this still is seen as really key for Mathilde. Also, the superlative most, referring to the most famous and sought after men, shows Mathilde's focus on superficiality and just how vapid she is in terms of what she wants from life. Also, she has this vapid desire to marry a really wealthy man, so she continuously daydreams of being around sought after men. Now, this is in contrast to her husband. So he comes home and he's, he declares delightedly when he looks at food. And this alliteration here shows that he's actually really content. So there's a vast emotional gap between Mathilde and her husband. Her interior state is completely the opposite from her husband's interior state. He's actually quite happy with the social position. Also, this happiness is further emphasised through the exclamatory sentences when he speaks. He says, stew, splendid, and this shows a vast gap between the emotional state of Mathilde and her husband. However, we are then focusing on how she thinks of walls which are filled with mythical characters. And so Mathilde feels her beauty should match a more fanciful reality. And there's a lot of supernatural language that's used and uncanny language. So characters, strange birds and enchanted forest. Again, this further emphasizes just how she retreats into the world of illusion and dreams. So let's carry on. She had no fine dresses, no jewelry, nothing and that was all she cared about. She felt that God had made her for such things. She would have given anything to be popular, envied, attractive and in demand. She had a friend who was rich, a friend from her convent days, on whom she never called now, for she was always so unhappy afterwards. Sometimes for days on end, she would weep, tears of sorrow, regret, despair and anguish. One evening, her husband came home looking highly pleased with himself. In his hand, he brandished a large envelope. Look, he said, I've got something for you. 
She tore the paper flap eagerly and extracted a printed card bearing these words. The Minister of Education and Madame Georges Rompenu request the pleasure of the company of Monsieur et Madame Loiselle at the Ministry buildings on the evening of 18 January. Instead of being delighted, as her husband had hoped, she tossed the invitation peevishly onto the table and muttered, What earthly use is that to me? But darling, I thought you'd be happy. You never go anywhere, and it's an opportunity, a splendid opportunity. I had the dickens of a job getting a hold of an invite. So stop there before we proceed. Now, this part of the passage essentially focuses on what Matilde sees as a really simple and austere lifestyle. She had no fine dresses, no jewellery. And the Sinderton hair emphasises that she feels she leads a really austere lifestyle. Also, there's lots of use of hyperbole, nothing, anything. Again, this shows just how melodramatic she feels and how she really doesn't take anything that she has as something that's a blessing she takes everything around her for granted again this also shows just how matilda is really ungrateful furthermore the mention of how god had made her for such things for such beautiful opulent luxuries this highlights that matilda believed her beauty entitled her to wealth also, the Sinderton, popular, envied, attractive, shows Matilda's quite materialistic and she really craves social acceptance. Furthermore, this is further emphasised with the repetition of friend and this is a reference to her friend who's living a much, much more affluent lifestyle and she's really obsessed with her friend's lifestyle to the point of depression. Moreover, the intensifier hair, where she states so, or rather where Maupassant states so, shows that she just really only cares about social acceptance, social appearances, and therefore because she can't keep up the same appearances as her other affluent friend, she's just really, really unhappy each time she sees her. Also, the semantic field of grief here, sorrow, regret, despair, anguish, which shows her jealousy, but also just how overdramatic she really is. Now, there's an adverbial phrase of time, one evening, and this temporal shift foreshadows irreversible changes which will take place in this story. Now, her husband comes home. He offers her something. He states, I've got something for you, and this simple sentence shows how much he values her. He goes to great lengths to make her happy. Also, the card has this invitation a very formal invitation, and the formal Lexis shows that's a very, very fancy society event. However, rather than appreciating her husband's efforts, she tosses away the invitation. So this verb is quite dramatic, tossed, and also the adverb peevishly. This shows how whilst her husband is very self-sacrificial, he almost actually takes on the role of women during this time. So women were the ones who are expected to be very self-sacrificial, very focused on making their partners happy. Actually, it's the opposite dynamic. Matilda is a person that's constantly unhappy whilst her husband is constantly focused on making her happy. However, nothing he does makes her happy. And of course, this is emphasized through this verb and the adverb. Moreover, when she questions, what earthly use is that to me? This shows that her unhappiness is greatly exaggerated. Now, her husband does use a mild expletive, expletive meaning a swear word, but it's very mild. He says, I had the dickens of a job getting hold of an invite. And of course, this shows just how hard he worked to get the invitation because he cares so much for his wife. So let's carry on. Everybody's after them. They're very much in demand and not many are handed out to ask clerks. You'll be able to see all the big knobs there. She looked at him irritably and said shortly, and what am I supposed to wear if I do go? He had not thought of that. He blustered. What about the dresses you wear for the theatre? It looks all right to me. The words died in his throat. He was totally disconcerted and dismayed by the sight of his wife who had began to cry. Two large tears rolled slowly out of the corners of her eyes and down the sides of her mouth. What's up? He stammered. What's the matter? Making a supreme effort, she controlled her sorrows and, wiping her damp cheeks, replied cal quite calmly, Nothing. It's just that I haven't got anything to wear and consequently I shan't be going to any reception. Give the invite to one of your colleagues with a wife who's in better off for clothes than I am. Now here, of course, Matilda really, really is overdramatic. She cries whilst her husband, she basically also in some ways takes advantage of her husband's kindness. Now here, the mention of this pronoun, us, emphasises her husband's actually quite aware of his social group, his lower middle class status, but he's still quite content. 
Also, the common noun, clerks, obviously emphasizes his modest job. And however, in contrast to his wife, he's still quite proud of it. Now, Mathilde looks at him irritably and she speaks to him shortly. And these adverbs show she's quite ungrateful and quite self-centered. She doesn't really recognize the sacrifices her husband makes. Now, the simple sentence here, he had not thought of that, shows how simplistic the husband's worldview is in contrast to his wife's very fantastical imagination and how much opulence she really craves. Furthermore, the personification, the words died in his throat, shows the power dynamics in their relationship. It's Matilda who clearly holds all the power, whilst her husband really tries to crave and to make her happier. Moreover, the alliteration, disconcerted and dismayed, this shows, again, her husband is really unhappy because he's not made Matilde happier. Furthermore, there's this melodramatic response which is emphasised with the two large tears. And the alliteration here shows that Matilde is really overdramatic. She's very melodramatic and she only cares about her superficial appearance. She won't go to the party because she's not going to dress in what appears to be a very expensive dress. Now, Montpassant says that she makes a supreme effort, and this hyperbole shows that she's very over-exaggerated in her responses. And her simple response, I shan't be going to any reception, is somewhat humorous. So there's also a kind of satiricism that's used by Montpassant to really make fun of Mathilde. Also here, she uses alliteration. She says with the wife who is better off. Now, of course, here what this alliteration is doing is showing how emphatic Mathilde is when she's rejecting this invitation because she doesn't have clothes that seemingly look quite expensive. Furthermore, the euphemism better off is a subtle reference to their social status. So Mathilde is really obsessed with social comparison. So let's carry on. He was devastated. He went on. Oh, come on, Mathilde, look, what could it cost to get something suitable that would do for other occasions something fairly simple? She thought for a few moments, working out her sums, but also wondering how much she could decently ask for without drawing an immediate refusal and pained protests from her husband, who was careful with his money. Finally, after some hesitation, she said, I can't say precisely, but I dare say I could get by on 400 francs. He turned slightly pale, for he had been setting aside just that amount to buy a gun and finance hunting trips the following summer in the flat landscape around Nanterre with a few friends who went shooting larks there on Sunday. But he said, very well, I'll give you your 400 francs, but do try and get a decent dress. The day of the reception drew near and Madame Loisel appeared sad, worried, anxious. Yet all her clothes were ready. One evening, her husband said, what's up? You haven't been act half been acting funny these last days. She replied. It vexes me that I haven't got a single piece of jewellery, not one stone that I can put on. I'll look like a church mouse. I'd almost as soon not go to the reception. So in this part of the passage, her husband actually agrees to give her money, lots of money, to go and buy a fancy dress. However, we then learn, of course, Matilde's wish and appetite for more and more luxury is quite insatiable because she then asks about necklace. Now, the simple sentence, he was devastated, emphasizes just how much Matilde's husband actually loves her and really wants to make her happy. However, here, when we learn that she was working out her sums, but also wondering how much she could decently ask for, what this actually starts highlighting is how manipulative Matilde is and she takes advantage of her husband's generosity. Also, there's alliteration used to emphasise the large amount of money that her husband is going to be parting with in order to make her happy. So he's going to be parting with the money that he would have otherwise used on a hunting trip with his friends to make her happy. And of course, it's emphasised through 400 francs. He also is very, very, um, he resigns himself to this through this minor sentence when he states very well, which of course shows he's quite generous. And the pronouns you, your 400 francs when he's talking about her money, which he's going to give him, this emphasizes his focus on her happiness. Furthermore, the tricolon, uh, which describe how Madame Lozell, this is Mathilde, who was sad, worried, anxious, shows she has really tumultuous moods. She's gotten the dress that she wants. She's gotten the money for the dress. However, she's still really anxious. And we still learn 
in spite of that, her clothes were ready. So she takes for granted the fact that she was even able to access these clothes. And she then mentions, it vexes me I haven't got a single piece of jewellery. So her wish for material possessions is highlighted as really insatiable. Furthermore, the simile, she'll look like a church mouse. This shows her callous ungratefulness. She's been given money to buy a new dress. She should be happy and very pleased. However, she wants more and she feels like she still looks very, very poor. So let's carry on. We're a posy, he said. It's all the rage this say. You could get two or three magnificent roses for 10 francs. She was not convinced. No, there's nothing so humiliating as to look poor when you're with women who are rich. But her husband exclaimed, you aren't half silly. Look, go and see your friend, Madame Forestier, and ask her to lend you some jewellery. You know her well enough for that. She gave a delighted cry. You're right, I never thought of that. The next day she called on a friend and told her about her problem. Madame Forestier went over to look to a mirror-fronted wardrobe, took out a large casket, brought it over, unlocked it, and said to Madame Loiselle, choose whatever you like. At first she saw bracelets, then a rope of pearls and a Venetian cross made of gold and diamonds admirably fashioned. She tried on the necklaces in the mirror and could hardly bear to take them off and give them back. She kept asking, have you got anything else? Yes, of course, just look. I can't say what thing you'd like best. All of a sudden, in a black satin wood case, she found a magnificent diamond necklace and her heart began to beat with immoderate desire. Now I'll pause there for a second. So here, her husband is quite practical in telling her maybe she can wear a uh, posy. So of course, the suggestion of flowers in place of a necklace shows he's still very simplistic in terms of what he thinks will suffice. He then mentions and uses a hyperbole, it's all the rage this year. He tries to maybe paint a positive picture of being a bit more modest to Matilde, who of course doesn't listen. And of course, this is emphasised when she uses the intensifier so, when she states there's nothing so humiliating as to look poor. And this shows that her focus on status is almost comical. Also, the mention of her looking poor reveals that Matilde only cares about appearances, surface appearances and the superficial appearances, rather than actually whether you're genuinely rich or not. This is further emphasised through the alliteration with women who, which shows she's constantly comparing herself to other women who have wealthier husbands. Her husband uses an exclamatory sentence to offer a solution. He reminds her of her wealthy friend, Madame Forestier, who could lend her jewellery. And of course, Matilda is really happy and the omnomatopoeia cry shows she's really excited again. This goes back to the idea of just looking rich. She's more interested in looking rich and wearing her friend's expensive jewellery to look the part rather than actually being the part. Also, the a cinderton, Madame Forestier went over to a mirror-fronted wardrobe, took out a large casket, brought it over, unlocked it. This shows her friend's very fluid movements. In contrast to Mathilde, her friend is really accustomed to having luxuries and she carelessly flaunts this wealth in her friend's face. She then also emphasises this through her language. Choose whatever you like. Of course, this shows that she has a very opulent lifestyle. She can spare a piece of jewellery to her friend who can borrow it. Now, the semantic field of jewellery emphasises again how wealthy Madame Forestier is. She has bracelets, pearls, diamonds. And then when Mathilde is looking through all of this, she looks in the mirror. Now, the mention of a mirror here shows us that she's almost like Narcissus, the Greek figure who fell in love with his reflection. Of course, this was his homage, this was his weakness, which led him to drown. So almost this vanity is Mathilde's own Hamashia, it's her own fatal flaw, and this is further emphasised with the word mirror. She then keeps on asking, have you got anything else? Again, she still covets more, she's insatiable in terms of material possessions. And then we are focused on the black satin wood case which her friend presents to her and this seems almost like a Pandora's box and again when you think about Greek mythology the Pandora's box once it was opened it unleashed all the evils in the world so perhaps this is foreshadowing by Maupassant that whatever is inside this black satin wood case it's like a Pandora's box for Mathilde it's going to unleash a lot of her travels that follow later on in the story. Also, there's this mention of this magnificent diamond necklace. So, of course, Mathilde really sees expensive objects as a way to look rich, forgetting she's actually not as wealthy as she'd like to appear. So let's carry on. 
Her hands shook as she picked it up. She fastened it around her throat, over her high-necked dress and sat looking at herself in rupture. Then diffidently, apprehensively, she asked, Can you lend me this? Nothing else, just this. But of course. She threw her arms around her friend, kissed her extravagantly, then ran home, taking a treasure with her. The day of the reception arrived. Madame Lazelle was a success. She was the prettiest woman there, elegant, graceful, radiant and wonderfully happy. All the men looked at her, inquired who she was and asked to be introduced. All the cabinet secretaries and undersecretaries wanted to waltz with her. She was even noticed by the minister himself. She danced ecstatically, wildly, intoxicated with pleasure, giving no thought to anything else, swept along on her victorious beauty and glorious success and floating on a cloud of happiness composed of the homage, admiration and desire she evoked and the kind of complete and utter triumph which was so sweet to a woman's heart. So, of course, once she gets this necklace, she goes and when the reception arrives, she looks really beautiful. So she has the seemingly beautiful appearance of wealth. And, of course, she revels in this. Now, in this part of the passage, of course, we find that when she's still in her friend's place, she sits and she's looking at herself in rapture. And, of course, this shows that further she's like Narcissus as she's enchanted with her own appearance, not realising it's going to be a downfall. Furthermore, she asks her friends, can you lend me this, nothing else, just this, and these simple sentences foreshadow how this necklace will dramatically alter her fate. Furthermore, her frenzied response in her friend after her friend agrees to lend her this necklace shows just how shallow Matilda is. She kisses her extravagantly. She's extremely shallow. She only cares about surface appearances. Also, the alliteration and the metaphor taking her treasure is ironic because we later realise actually this necklace is not really worth much. But because it looks expensive, Matilde perceives it as treasure. Of course, the simple sentence, Madame Lazelle was a success, shows that this is all she's ever wanted. All she's ever wanted was to be centre of attention and to be perceived as really rich, beautiful and successful. The superlative prettiest shows, of course, how society at the time only valued women based on their beauty. Moreover, the mention of all the men looked at her further emphasises Mathilde's beauty. And we learn of these different really high status men, the cabinet secretaries and the undersecretaries, and the repetition of secretaries emphasises their superior social status. This is what Mathilde really wants. Also, the syndeton that's used to describe how she danced ecstatically, wildly, intoxicated with pleasure, shows how vain she is and how she has a very superficial understanding of value. Moreover, the notion of her victorious beauty supports the idea that beautiful women of no means can actually socially advance. Also, the metaphor that describes how she was floating on a cloud of happiness shows just how happy Matilde is to be really recognised for her beauty, for her surface appearance. Furthermore, the idea that this is just so sweet to a woman's heart shows the only thing that Matilde cares for is social approval. So let's continue. She left at about four in the morning. Since midnight, her husband had been dozing in a small empty side room with three other men whose wives were having an enjoyable time. He helped, her, he helped her on with her coat, which he had fetched when it was time to go. A modest, everyday coat, a commonplace coat, violently at odds with the elegance of her dress. It brought her down to earth, and she would have preferred to slip away quietly and avoid being noticed by the other women who were being arrayed in rich furs. But Loiselle grabbed her by the arm. Wait a sec, you catch a cold outside, I'll go and get a cab. But she refused to listen and ran quickly down the stairs. When they are outside in the street, there was no cab in sight. They began looking for one, hailing all the cabbies they saw driving by in the distance. They walked down the Seine in desperation, shivering with cold. There, on the embankment, they at last found one of those aged nocturnal hackney cabs, which only emerge in Paris after dusk, as if ashamed to parade their poverty in the full light of day. It bore them back to the front door on the Rue des Mateurs, and they walked sadly up to the apartment. For her, it was all over, while he was thinking that he would have to be at the ministry at ten. Standing in front of the mirror, she took off the coat she had been wearing over her shoulders to get a last look at herself in all her glory. Suddenly, she gave a cry. The necklace was no longer around her throat. So now this part of the passage shows just how much fun Matilde is having. 
So of course she has a complete disregard for her husband. So we learned that since midnight, her husband had been dozing in a small empty side room. She's completely tossed him to the side whilst she's reveling in people's attention. Once the party is over, she's dressed in a modest, everyday, commonplace coat. And the adjectives and the repetition of the coat that she's wearing shows her appearance of wealth vanishes once this is over. Of course, the adverb violently shows the disconnect between her ordinary clothes that she wears every day versus the clothes that she's bought for this one-off occasion just to be socially recognised. Moreover, the mention of how this brought her down to earth, the coat is personified here and it forces her to leave this fanciful world of imagination where she thinks she's a very rich debutante and now she's back to reality. And of course, this is in contrast to the other women who actually are married to rich men who can wear rich furs. Now, her husband says, wait a sec, you catch a cold outside or go and get a cab. And this simple sentences, they show his love and commitment and devotion to her. However, Mathilde refused to listen. And this, of course, shows that Mathilde really disregards him and to, in, to an extent actually uses her husband. Also, when they start walking down the Seine, which is a large river in Paris, in desperation, shivering with cold, pathetic fallacy is used here by Maupassant to show the stark return to reality and their real social status de descending upon them. Furthermore, they look for aged nocturnal hackney cabs and the adjectives here emphasise that reality has really descended on them. Now, these cabs are also ashamed to parade their poverty. And of course, this is a metaphor for Mathilde herself, who's really ashamed of her perceived poverty. She thinks she's quite poor and she's really ashamed. She tries to hide it. Now, they live on Rue de Marta, which in English is just the road of martyrs. Now, this mentions uh, this mention of martyrs, people who die for a cause, foreshadows their eventual poverty. Now, Maupassant states that for her it was all over and therefore what this shows is that the illusion of wealth that Mathilde had has finally ended. Now she then stands in front of the mirror and there's this reference back to her obsession with her appearance almost like Narcissus and of course this highlights her vanity. However onomatopoeia is used to show how she gave a cry because it echoes the cry that she had in Madame Forestier's home when she saw this beautiful necklace and she was given this beautiful necklace for the night. However, now this onomatopoeia is somewhat ironic because it's echoing this cry of horror. Also, the mention of the necklace no longer being around her throat Montpassant uses exclamatory sentence to show her extreme shock. Now, this is the twist that happens because she loses this necklace. So let's carry on. Her husband, who was already half undressed, asked, What's up? She turned to him in a panic. I, I, I Madame Forestier's necklace, I haven't got it. He straightened up as if thunderstruck. What? But you can't have lost it. They looked in the pleats of her dress, in the folds of her coats, as in her pockets. They looked everywhere. They did not find it. Are you sure you still had it when you left the ballroom? He asked. Yes, I remember fingering it in the entrance hall. But if you'd lost it in the street, we'd have heard it fall. So it must be in the cab. That's right. That's probably it. Did you get his number? No. Did you happen to notice it? No. Now, in this exchange, of course, we can see that she is really really panicked because here she states i madame forrester's necklace she's really really speechless and she really doesn't know what to do next and of course this examinatory sentence shows she's growing increasingly panicked then her husband essentially this simile as if thunderstruck shows his dramatic reaction now, this simple sentence, I did not find it, shows the necklace, which symbolised the illusion of wealth, is now gone. So this illusion of wealth and this illusory world that Mathilde had really created, this elaborate illusory world, is now completely over. Now, her husband really rationalises where they might be able to find this necklace and this complex sentence, but if you'd lost it in the street, would have heard it fall. This shows he's trying to really rationalise the situation, he's trying to really see things from her perspective. And now the simple sentences, so her responses to him shows she actually reverts to listening to her husband when it suits her. Now here, the minor sentence, and remember a minor sentence is a sentence without a verb, a subject verb, 
Now, in this instance, the minor sentence, so her response shows she was caught up in a fanciful imagination that she was unaware of what had happened to the necklace. So let's carry on. They looked at each other in dismay. Finally, Loiselle got dressed again. I'm going to go back the way we came, he said. See if I can find it. He went out. She remained as she was, still wearing her evening gown, not having the strength to go to bed, sitting disconsolately on a chair by the empty grate, her mind a blank. Her husband returned at about seven o'clock. He'd found nothing. He went to the police station, called at the newspaper offices where he had advertised a reward, toured the cab companies and tried anywhere where the faintest of hopes led him. She waited for him all day long in the same distracted condition, thinking of the appalling catastrophe which had befallen them. Loiselle came back that evening, hollow-cheeked and very pale. He had not come up with anything. Look, he said, you'll have to write to your friend and say you broke the catch on a necklace and you're getting it repaired. That will give us time to work out what we'll have to do. She wrote to his dictation. A week later, they'd lost all hope. Now, here, essentially the simple sentence where it states they looked at each other in dismay really now creates tension for us as the readers because we now really wonder, is this necklace really gone? Then, the simple sentence he went out highlights the self-sacrificial nature of Mathilde's husband. He really wants to save face for her. Now, in contrast to his self-sacrificial nature, she remained as she was. Now, the sibilance, she, and of course the repetition of she, emphasises how Mathilde is really not self-sacrificing. She's completely focused on herself and what she wants. Furthermore, her mind a blank. This metaphor emphasises her really vapid nature. She really cannot come up with any useful ideas to help in this situation. Now, the repetition of the third person pronoun he shows how frantically he was trying to help her as his wife. He really, really cares about saving her social face. Now, Mathilde is in a distracted condition. Again, this emphasises her very vapid mindset. She really cannot come up with any useful way to react to this situation and essentially this catastrophe. Now, her husband advises her, you'll have to write to your friend, say you broke the catch on her necklace and you're getting it repaired. That'll give us time to work out what we'll have to do. Now, essentially, what this is showing is he's trying to save face for her. He's trying to, of course, save face for himself, but more importantly, he's trying not to embarrass his wife to her friend. And this shows just how much he really genuinely loves her. And of course, she takes advantage of this generosity. Now, here, again, she only listens to him when it benefits her. She wrote to his dictation. So previously, when it really didn't benefit her, she totally ignored him but now it's benefiting her she listens to exactly what he says now the adverbial phrase of time a week later shows the drastic change in their fortunes as a result of this necklace and as a result of Mathilde's focus on superficial objects and superficial material items so let's carry on Lozelle who'd aged five years said we'll have to start thinking about replacing the necklace the next day they took the case in which it had come and called on the jeweler whose name was inside he looked through his order book. It wasn't me that sold the actual necklace, I only supplied the case. After this, they trailed around jewellery shops, looking for a necklace just like the other one, trying to remember it, and both ill with worry and anxiety. In a shop in the Palais Royal, they found a diamond collar which they thought was identical to the one they were looking for. It cost 40,000 francs. The jeweller was prepared to let them have it for 36. They asked him not to sell it for three days, and they got him to agree to take it back for 34000 if the one that had been lost turned up before the end of February. Lozelle had 18,000 francs, which his father had left him. He would have to borrow the rest. Now, things really start to escalate, essentially. So after they realise that the necklace is gone, they go around town searching for it. However, they come up quite short, and ultimately, they find a similar diamond collar, which costs astronomically more. And it seems that Mathilde's husband, Loisel, is so self-sacrificial that he is considering giving up his inheritance just to help her save face. Now here, where it states Loisel, who's aged five years, essentially Montpassant uses this hyperbole to show how his wife is really causing him ruin. Also, the alliteration they took the case emphasizes this Pandora's box. It's now been opened. It's now causing all of these problems. And of course, we learned that the jeweler is not the same person who actually sold the same necklace. 
Furthermore, the statement that trailed around jeweler's shops, this shows now that they're really frantically searching, really frantically trying to come up with alternatives. Now, the alliteration they thought really shows that they only rely on superficial appearances, which proves to be their undoing. Furthermore, 40,000 francs, this is an astronomical sum of money. We now start wondering as readers, what's going to happen? We think that maybe the most rational decision will just be for Mathilde to go back to her friend and really confess her sins. But really they seem, even in spite of how expensive this uh, replacement necklace is, they care more about replacing it so that they can look good in front of the friend. Now here, where we learn about Loisel's 18,000 franc inheritance, we learn that he's willing to give it up just to preserve his wife's unhappiness. Maybe this is his own undoing too. Furthermore, the emphasis on him even borrowing more shows that Mathilde is really bringing him financial ruin. Her focus on superficial materials is causing this financial chaos, is wreaking financial chaos on their lives. So let's carry on. He borrowed the money, a thousand francs here, 500 there, sometimes a hundred and as little as 60. He signed notes, agreed to pay exorbitant rates of interest, resorted to usurers and the whole tribe of moneylenders. He mortgaged the rest of his life, signed papers without knowing if he would ever be able to honour his commitments and then sick with worry about the future, the grim poverty which stood ready to pounce and the prospect of all the physical privation and mental torture ahead. He went round to the jewellers to get the new necklace with the 36,000 francs which he put on the counter. When Madame Loisel took it round, Madame Forestier said in a huff, You ought really to have brought it back sooner. I might have needed it. She did not open the case as a friend had feared she might. If she had noticed the substitution, what would she have thought? What would she have said? Would she not have concluded she was a thief? Then began for Madame Loisel the grindingly horrible life of the very poor. But quickly and heroically, she resigned herself to what she could not alter, that appalling debt would have to be repaid. She was determined to pay, they dismissed the maid, they moved out of their apartment and rented an attic room. So by this stage of the story, essentially we learned that both Mathilde and her husband Loisel decided to go into debt in order to save face. This is how much appearances, holding, holding up a social appearance is important to them, more important than their own futures. And of course, ultimately, they actually fall in social status. So Mathilde, initially, this discontent she felt with her lower middle class background, actually, it's now gets even worse. Now here, where we learned that Loisel borrowed the money, a thousand francs here, 500 there, the ascendant that's used shows how frantically he's borrowing from several people simply to save social face. And he's a martyr for his wife. So if you remember Rue de Martyrs, this is now really bringing it to full circle because this is really extremely self-sacrificial on his part. Also, there's the semantic field of debt that's used, interest, usurers, money lenders. This is showing just how he's getting into financial ruin as a result of his very superficial wife. Now, the mention of the grim poverty. What this shows is that superficial appearances have costed them heavy. They've cost, it's costed them the social status and this poverty which stood ready to pounce. Now, the personification of poverty emphasises its brutality and the grinding poverty that they're going to have to undergo simply because they wanted to look good in front of Mathilde's friend. Furthermore, the reference to physical privation and mental torture. It's really ironic that Mathilde is now about to experience real suffering, whilst actually early on in the story, she thought she was experiencing some kind of suffering, which is going to be nothing compared to now the years of grinding poverty that stare them. Also, the conditional verb might, when Madame Lozelle, Mathilde, returns it to her friend, this conditional verb shows just how self-centered and greedy her friend is, and of course, just how superficial their friendship is. Moreover, her friend actually doesn't even really care for that necklace because we learned she did not open the case. She didn't even care enough for a necklace or even value it to check that it was actually there and it was the right thing. Now, we have a view into Mathilde's worries through the rhetorical questions. What should, what would she have thought? What would she have said? Would she not have concluded she was a thief? Now, these rhetorical questions show Mathilde cares so much about social appearances and saving face. Now we start to see the contrast to her previous earlier life of somewhat okay leisure. So now she's really gonna start experiencing the grindingly horrible life of the very poor. 
Furthermore, the adverbs quickly and heroically show, to some extent actually, Matilde starts to see value in her suffering. So her suffering, which has been caused because of losing this necklace, actually her now to working to get out of poverty, she starts to see a lot of value in doing so. Moreover, the simple sentence she was determined to pay makes us actually wonder whether Mathilde's poverty might change her superficial outlook and make her less materialistic. Moreover, the repetition of the third person plural pronoun emphasises how the social fall from middle class to working class status is very, very final. So let's carry on. She became used to heavy domestic work and all kinds of ghastly kitchen chores. She washed dishes, wearing down her pink nails on the greasy pots and saucepans. She washed the dirty sheets, shirts and floor cloths by hand and hung them up to dry on a line. Each morning she took the rubbish down to the street and carried the water up, pausing for breath on each landing. And, dressed like any working class woman, she shopped at the fruiterers, the grocers and the butchers with a basket over her arm, haggling, frequently abused and always counting every penny. Each month they had to settle some accounts, renew others and bargain for time. Her husband worked in the evenings doing accounts for a shopkeeper and quite frequently sat up into the early hours doing copying work for five sous a page. They lived like this for 10 years. By the time 10 years had gone by, they'd repaid everything with not a penny outstanding in spite of the extortionate conditions and including the accumulated interest. Madame Luzel looked old now. She had turned into the battling, hard, uncouth housewife who ruled working class homes. Her hair wasn't tidy, her skirts were askew, and her hands were red. She spoke in a gruff voice and scrubbed floors on her hands and knees. But sometimes when her husband had gone to the office, she would sit by the window and think of that evening long ago when she had been so beautiful and so admired. So now we get an insight into essentially this life of grinding poverty. And this is really now a cautionary, almost morality tale by Guy de Maupassant of being excessively materialistic. Now here we learn that Mathilde gets used to heavy domestic work, ghastly kitchen chores, and the pre-modifiers, so heavy domestic and ghastly kitchen. These are ironic because she actually used to look down on having a simple maid from Preton. Also, the repetition of the third person pronouns, she, of course, referring back to Mathilde, shows and makes us really focus on how drastically her situation has changed and obviously how vapid her worry and unhappiness at her earlier lower middle class status really was. Moreover, the mention of pink nails, especially the adjective pink, emphasizes how dainty her appearance once was, but now she no longer has those luxuries. Also, she's described as pausing for breath on each landing, and essentially what this does is emphasise how unaccustomed to labour Mathilde really was. Also, the simile, like any working class woman, contrasts Mathilde to her early appearance at the party, how dainty and beautiful she was. Now she's really a working class woman. Also, she has to settle some accounts, renew others and bargain for time. And really, the rule of three here shows just how deeply in debt they were, simply because she was so focused on superficial appearances around wealth. Moreover, we learned that Loisel, her husband, worked, and the alliteration here emphasises his self-sacrificial nature. And they lived like this for 10 years. So the mention of 10 years showed they experienced grinding poverty for a long time as a result of their reliance on superficial appearances. And of course, 10 years is repeated, just so that Montpassant can really emphasise this. Furthermore, the simple sentence, Madame Loisel looked old now, she is a warning that beauty fades and she has become a victim of the same superficial standards that she greatly admired. So she will become a victim of the same superficial standards which uphold beauty too highly. Also, we learned that she turned into the battling, hard, uncouth housewife. Now, the tricolon hair, battling, hard and uncouth, shows she no longer has the same social graces she once did. Furthermore, the mention of working class homes shows that Mathilde has become accustomed to her working class status. Also, the fact that she spoke in a gruff voice and scrubbed floor with her hands and knees. This complex sentence shows how degrading her life has become. Now she's really experiencing real suffering. She then thinks of that evening long ago, so her daydreams also have changed. They're no longer lofty illusions, but she does miss her past life and her faded beauty. Moreover, the intensifiers so shows her internal dialogue. 
let's continue. What might not have happened had she not lost the necklace? Who could tell? Who could possibly tell? Life is so strange, so fickle. How little is needed to make or break us. One Sunday, needing a break from a heavy working week, she went out for a stroll in Champs-Élysées. Suddenly, she caught sight of a woman pushing a child on a pram. It was Madame Forestier, still young, still beautiful and still attractive. Madame Loisel felt apprehensive. Should she speak to her? Yes, why not? Now that she had paid him full, she'll tell her everything. Why not? She went up to her. Hello, Jeanne. The friend did not recognise her and was taken aback at being addressed so familiarly by a common woman in the street. She stammered. But, I'm sorry, I, I don't know. There's some mistake. No mistake. I'm Mathilde Loisel. Her friend gave a cry. But my poor Mathilde, oh, how you've changed. Yes, I've been through some hard times since I saw you very hard times and it was all on your account on my account whatever do you mean so now in this part of the passage this is after 10 years have passed and of course they've settled all their debts of course they're now back to to being working class so they've no longer recovered in terms of their status but Matilde goes out on a walk and then she sees her friend from the past life the friend that essentially caused them to go into so much deep debt and it's interesting this exchange so let's look at the opening part of this part of the passage so what might not have happened had she not lost the necklace who could tell who could possibly tell now these rhetorical questions show Matilde's wishful thinking as she's reflecting on that really fateful night that changed all her fortunes so these rhetorical questions show how she is wondering what might have happened had things gone differently. Furthermore, the series of exclamatory sentences which answer these rhetorical questions to an extent, how life is so strange, so fickle, how needed is, uh, how little is needed to make or break us, these exclamatory sentences maybe show some level of growth. However, of course, that growth is a little bit limited as we'll learn later on. Now, there's an adverbial phrase of time here to show now a sudden shift. So we are signified of this by Guy de Montpensant when he says one Sunday. Now, Mathilde goes for a walk and suddenly she caught sight of a woman and the sibilance here signifies a sharp shift in the tempo of this story. Now, we learn that Madame Forestier is still young, still beautiful and still attractive. And the repetition of still as well as the rule of three, which lists she's young, beautiful and attractive, shows their contrasting appearances and, of course, a vast social gap. Madame Forestier was still able to stay in her upper class position. Now, there's this, of course, this contrast, and this is obviously a contrast between social station and social pedigree. This is emphasised through the proper formal reference to Madame Forestier versus Madame Loisel. And of course, this is a massive contrast to show just how vastly the social statuses have changed. Now, Madame Loisel, Mathilde, wonders, should she speak to her? Yes, why not? And these rhetorical questions show that she does for the first time in a long while feel really self-conscious because she looks poor now. Then she mentions her name and this is a really informal address. Again, this is showing that Mathilde has really lost her social graces. Now, where it states the friend did not recognise her, this shows the deceptiveness of appearances. So her friend really relies on appearances too. So Madame Forestier, she relies on the appearance of Mathilde when she used to be beautiful, but now she doesn't recognise her. But also we wonder whether this is really a true friendship if she never really kept in touch with her for 10 years, only to not recognise her. Furthermore, the reference to Mathilde as a common woman, this adjective common shows her fall in social status and how her friend now really looks down on her. There's a series of ellipses when Madame Forestier responds to her and this shows her fear of women from a lower social class and a lower social pedigree, the fear of upper class women. Now, Mathilde responds by saying, no mistake, Mathilde Lozal, and these simple sentences are quite blunt. And again, these show that she's really lost her social graces. She's no longer speaking in that very dainty, very measured social way. Now, Madame Forestier gives a cry. And again, this onomatopoeia is used to show her shock. Now, Mathilde confesses to her that she's been through hard times and the repetition of hard times shows how she's become probably more grounded in reality after facing grinding poverty. 
However, we wonder whether she's really changed because she blames her friend. She says it was on your account. She's blaming her friend for her poverty. She doesn't actually realize and she doesn't possess the power of self-reflection to maybe realize that it was actually her own fault that she's now in this situation. So let's continue. Do you remember that diamond necklace you lent me to go to the reception at the ministry? Yes, what about it? Well, I lost it. Lost it? But you returned it to me. No, I returned another one just like it. And we've been paying for it at least past 10 years. You know, it wasn't easy for us. We had nothing. But it's over and done with now, and I'm glad. Madame Forestier stopped. You mean you bought a diamond necklace to replace mine? Yes. You never noticed the difference, did you? They were exactly alike. And she smiled a proud, innocent smile. Madame Forestier looked very upset and, taking both her hand in her, said, Oh, my poor Mathilde. But it was only an imitation necklace. It couldn't have been worth much more than 500 francs. Now, this ending, of course, is a massive plot twist because Mathilde realises that all her suffering was for nothing. Her suffering was actually caused by her reliance on thinking expensive things actually had value. Expensive looking things had value. And of course, this is caused by her over-reliance on superficial appearance of things. Now here, when she confesses, well, I lost it. Now we see through the simple sentence that she's finally confessing when she knows she has saved face. Now her friend is really confused. She says, lost it, but you returned it to me. And Mathilde tells her, and again, we now start to sense that Mathilde, she saw some meaningfulness in her suffering. However, she hasn't grown that much because she's still very accusing of her friend. She states, you know, it wasn't easy for us. And this shows that Mathilde is still not taking responsibility for her actions. Now, the simple sentence, Madame Forestier stopped, signifies a plot twist. Now, Mathilde states, and you never noticed a difference, did you? They were exactly alike and this hyperphora shows she's so proud of what she was able to accomplish. And remember, hyperphora is when there's a question asked and then it's directly answered right after. Now, we learned that she has this proud, innocent smile and these adjectives show how Mathilde, to some extent, did find some meaning in her suffering. But she only found meaning in her suffering when she was relying on the superficiality of the appearances she was upholding. Now, her friend tells her, oh, my poor Mathilde, and this exclamatory sentence shows she's about to reveal something that's a really earth-shattering truth. She then reveals to Mathilde that it's an imitation necklace, and the adjective imitation highlights the deceptiveness of superficial appearances, and of course, the moral of this story that we should not rely on superficial appearances. And of course, we learned that the necklace was actually only worth 500 francs, which shows the danger of giving too much power to material belongings. Now that's all. If you found this video useful, we do have a course covering the GCSE anthology and all the texts in this iGCSE Pearson Edexcel anthology. So make sure you sign up and you head over to our course and also check out our website, which is www.firstreetutors.com for lots of English worksheets, courses and materials to help you in this and indeed other areas of English. Thank you so much for listening.